Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's presentation. What's the deal with data and microservices applications? Brought to you by NuoDB. So I'd like to introduce our presenters. As Senior Product Manager at NuoDB, Joe Leslie helps drive NuoDB product releases and roadmap to ensure NuoDB's database leadership position delivering elastic SQL database scale out and continuous availability for hybrid cloud applications. Joe has over 20 years of experience delivering database products and management tools in the transactional and analytical database marketplace. Marius works as chief architect at Red Hat, leading the efforts around data streaming and Red Hat middleware, enabling the development and operation of data streaming solutions for Red Hat portfolio, targeting OpenShift. Marius has a long-standing interest in enterprise application integration, event-driven architecture, and data strategies. And before joining Red Hat, he was leading Spring Cloud Stream as part of the Spring team at Pivotal, as well as contributing to various projects in the Spring portfolio such as Spring Cloud Dataflow, Spring Integration, and Spring Kafka. He is co-author to Spring Integration in Action. And now I'm going to turn things over to Joe and Marius to begin our presentation. Great. Thank you, Billy. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, yeah, we have a lot in store, so we'll just go ahead and share a bit about um, you know, the, what areas we would like to cover with you today. Um, so first, we're going to cover some of the challenges around deploying microservices, uh, um, specifically with uh, SQL-based applications. Uh, that's going to be part of our focus today. And breaking down what, um, what we're going to call the, the database monolith. And then we're going to go into some uh, best practice use cases and approaches that we'd like to share on, on how you can uh, better access and protect SQL databases in a microservices uh, deployment architecture. And then, and then finally, we'll land uh, this with um, some more about NuoDB and how NuoDB can specifically help you deploy these types of data strategies inside of OpenShift uh, that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, so as we get started, uh, we're going to take a view from the CIO office. And um, well, I'm not a CIO, but um, fortunately, I get to speak with many of them. And uh, many of us here know DB as well and Red Hat also. Um, so we have a pretty good view of what CO, CIOs require these days and, and what and the, and the challenges they're faced with. Uh, you know, many companies today are, are seeking sort of that next frontier of IT efficiencies. And, and typically it's around some of the same areas of saving OpEx and increasing bottom line. But uh, today to further it, uh, the IT team must be agile and they must respond more quickly to requests for change. Um, you know, moving our applications to the cloud um, has, has really been one where uh, there's this promise that the apps are, you know, always on or always available and, uh, you know, with rolling upgrade and, and all of these capabilities, but that's a really hard thing to deliver on. And, and how do we actually, um, you know, deliver on all those promises? So, um, you know, if we look at, um, you know, deploying and winning in today's cloud microservices and container deployment world, yesterday's tech no longer delivers. Uh, uh, you know, monolithic software stacks with tightly integrated components means that everything must deploy together, you know, like, like a bundle. And it, it, it sort of, you know, it slows the ability to push out changes quickly and, and really, data center architectures haven't changed much over the years with, um, you know, the, the, the assumption there is that, you know, migrations always mean downtime and, and you know, scale up instead of uh, uh, scale out to increase performance. And high availability has really always been, you know, the equation of high availability equals, you know, high complexity and high costs. And really, each one of these ends up being a, like a roadblock. Um, you know, when trying to deploy always on applications. So, so let's take a look at the effort to migrate an existing app. 
uh, to a microservice application. And, and you know, again, we're focusing here on SQL-based applications. And, and really, as the first bullet sort of points out, you know, most of the applications, these enterprise applications, are if we generalize, many of them use SQL, right? They, they attach to a SQL database. So, so in moving to the, the cloud and trying to uh, gain the, um, you know, kind of scale out capability, you know, switching to a NoSQL database could be one of those options, right? NoSQL offers, you know, easy scale out. But when we look at the risks associated with, you know, complete rewrite of the data management logic and retraining app developers and DBAs to learn new tools and, and um, uh, you know, migrating the data from, from a relational uh, format to a key value store, um, is a huge investment. So, so really, you know, what if you could keep your SQL applications and still gain the same advantages of running in containers or, you know, microservice environment? So how to achieve this is really a large part of what we want to share with you today. Uh, so, so on this next slide, it goes into what we're going to cover a little more of what I was calling a monolith, the, the database architecture, right? I mean, traditional SQL databases, they were architected probably, uh, you know, near about three decades ago. And, um, you know, the architecture was optimized for, uh, you know, different infrastructure, right? Metric multiprocessing machines, scale up, not scale out. Memory was very expensive. Um, and, you know, this is the, um, you know, kind of the world um, those those databases started in, um, you know, and they require a lot of add-ons for replication and DR and, and, and you know, backup and recovery. Um, and, and of course they, they typically have required expensive, dedicated, highly configured um, hardware to, to increase the performance. So if we look to the right, and this is where I show off my, my very, you know, fancy Google Sheet uh, capabilities, I have built a stack of blocks. That stack of blocks indicates this monolith, right? And it, it, it's showing sort of these components that I mentioned that are sort of glued together tightly, right? And they, they sort of move as one. They're like Legos connected, and they move as one. Um, but unlike Legos, they, they really don't break apart easily uh, versus a more um, containerized modular approach, which is where we're we're able to realize many more efficiencies, uh, you know, agile uh, deployment methodologies and automations. And, and this is really the direction that, that we want to try to go. So, you know, so if we, if we take, here's a, a, a you know, a, a real example, right? A, a, a common traditional two decade old uh, Oracle rack uh, architecture, right? Difficult to set up, you know, huge investment, complex, uh, again, these tightly coupled uh, components of backup and HA and, and, and all the software that moves together, um, you know, with, with shared disk architectures and so on to, to sort of achieve scale out. But again, very expensive proposition and still really only delivers high availability, not continuous availability. So um, with that as kind of a backdrop and an intro, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to um, Marius. And Marius is going to take us through some of the data strategies for HA microservices and some of the, the best practices that you know, Red Hat is, is, uh, has to offer us as they work uh, with their customers in the field. Thanks a lot, Joe. Uh, this is a great introduction to the challenges that microservices developers and operators face, especially when working with relational databases. And uh, as Joe has just mentioned, like at, at Red Hat and especially uh, with our OpenShift customers, I mean, our OpenShift users, uh, we've seen a lot of use cases. We've kind of gathered a, um, a lot of knowledge about uh, the best practices that we have for running microservices, for running data services uh, on a cloud platform. So I think it would be very useful right now to take a look and try to understand how things have come to be this way. What are we why are we using microservices? What are the use cases? And basically what strategies can we employ to manage data in a microservice architecture? And then once we have that done, we can take a look at what the OpenShift platform has to offer for running both microservices and data services and how to address concerns such as high availability and disaster recovery, right? And 
if you think about the motivations for microservices first, um, it's important to understand that, at, as, as Joe has mentioned earlier, for decades, the traditional development model was focused on monoliths. And monoliths were the norm, both in terms of like, both, both, for, both for applications and both for infrastructure. And that was a good thing because that brought a lot of cost efficiency. You were concerned how to minimize the cost of running applications, running infrastructure, running everything. And that's basically because when you're running everything on physical machines or you're running everything on, on, on at best on virtual machines, the overhead of provisioning new resources, new machines is very big. So there is an incentive to concentrate everything in one place, right? Cost was dominant, right? It was just more efficient, right? So from a development process perspective, this favors a very linear, almost like waterfall approach. Um, the goal was to translate everything we know, like everything, like kind of develop a comprehensive view of the business domain, like everything there is there in a uh, centralized data model, the database is basically the, is, is the center of the universe. Um, you end up with these massive uh, database schemas with like hundreds of, or uh, maybe like thousands of tables, like encompassing everything in, the, in, in, in a single place. And then we started mapping POJOs and start creating, started creating monolithic applications that contain the business logic that talk to this, uh, to this database schema. And that is a pretty fragile model because on one hand, the monolithic data models around which the entire set of applications is, is, uh, are structured are hard to change. So it's really, it's, really, it's really hard to intervene and change something at the, like if, if you discover new things, if you want to uh, adapt your business, it's actually kind of hard to do. On the other hand, uh, the monolithic applications that are coming out of that are pretty hard to scale. So how can we do better? So if you go on the next slide, uh, then we can take, uh, <clears throat> we, we have different, like, we, we are provided with alternatives. We can think in different terms uh, about the relationship between data and applications. First and foremost, there are techniques like domain-driven design that are um, add, they're adding focus on better understanding the domain model from the perspective of features and subsystems and the way they interact with each other. So it's not only about modularization, it's also about thinking of all the interactions that happen in the domain first and then starting to design uh, different, uh, different data models that fit the different uh, subsyst subsystems that uh, compose your application. Because really, like if you look at like even the same entities or even the same, uh, the same components can be very different from a perspective, like from the perspective of one subsystem or another, right? Uh, a ticket or a flight can mean something in when we're trying to uh, book a flight, but it can be something very different when we try to check in to a flight, right? So we have an example over there. The net result of this is that we end up defining more granular, more focused part of the domain. Uh, we basically center everything uh, around bounded contexts, which are, and that this basically builds agility into the process as we can start isolating change to individual subsystems without affecting everything else. And now that we put some modularization in place, we have options. So even before, even before we talk about microservices, uh, we can think about uh, either deploying these parts together as kind of a more comprehensive applications, which is what we call in this case, a fast monolith, or we can just deploy each of these individual, uh, each of these bounded contexts as um, as microservices, as in deploy the independent deployment units. And the advantage for microservices is that is that they can allocate resources and scale independently. But in both cases, when you look at it, um, it becomes apparent that isolating functionality is just not enough. And in order for this isolation to be properly preserved, we also need to isolate the data models, and we need to isolate the way these uh, components interact with databases. 
So we have to think about strategies that we have for, for, for handling data in this kind of scenario. So if you go on the, uh, if you go on the next slide, then um, one of like the, the, like the most fundamental and typical strategy for, for, for handling, uh, for dealing with this is what's basically called one database per microservice. We can enforce isolation here, but just allocating kind of one, by using one database per, per microservice or per fast monolith. And it makes sense because as each bounded context has its own data model, we also have an isolated data store. And it also gives us a lot of flexibility in choosing our storage strategies. So you can have a relational database, you can have a NoSQL database, so you have, you have basically choices. Now, one of the things to remember is that databases are generally speaking uh, uh, middleware, they are, they are not designed, like, at least traditional databases are not designed to be very lightweight components, right? So <clears throat> there are operational challenges with managing multiple traditional database instances. You cannot just uh, you know, launch and deploy like 100 of them if you have 100 microservices, right? So one of the typical ways to implement this is to maintain, like to respond to this kind of uh, limitation is to maintain a single central database instance or you know, a bunch of instances and use the multi-tenancy and isolation features, things like logical databases or schemas whatever they call in their individual terminology, but then still maintain a logical database from each subsystem's perspective, right? And sometimes, it, it especially when you're having uh, monolith to microservice migration scenarios, like for example, what we can see in the, in, in the following slide, um, you have situations where, like especially when you're extracting functionality and you're extracting microservices out of the monolith, you cannot really uh, do this database refactoring, so you still have to maintain a uh, you know you still have to maintain a centralized schema. You still have to maintain a uh, uh, you know a common uh, data model, but um, especially when you have, for example, legacy applications that talk to that. But what you want is to be able to still construct these individual data models on top of a, a shared database schema. So one strategy here is, for example, virtualization, right? To deal with this, this uh, impedance mismatch of having one, one single centralized database, one single centralized uh, table model, but then have separate uh, data models in each of these uh, microservices or you know, fast monoliths or components. Right. So it, it, it's important to remember that one of the goals is to recreate this effect of data model isolation that comes with, with one database per service, right? And how do we deal with, with one other consequence, right? Increased latency. So in the next slides, we talk about a little bit about, we need to talk a little bit about caching, right? One of the most common fallacies in distributed computing is that we can make remote calls behave exactly like local calls. And that's not true, right? I don't think anyone believes that. Um, we have APIs that give us that illusion, but in the end, remote calls are remote calls. They go over the network, they have latencies, they have failures, all kinds of complications. And one of these is latency. So if you have multiple applications talking to each other, then calling other applications, which in turn go forth and call other applications. So we basically have this chain of invocations. Um, latency can compound really fast. So if you look at this uh, at this diagram, right, the booking system kind of goes to check-in, goes to a bunch of other microservices and so on and so forth. You can see, like, you can easily have five, like five, six, ten, like it could be a number of ten, like depending on, on, on how big these architectures end up. It can have like a chain of, of, of uh, double digit invocations as part of, of, of one call. So treating all of them as remote calls is just not feasible. You will, you will end up having like uh, massive latencies. So obviously caching can help here by reducing the number of remote calls, reducing the latency at each individual um, uh, application level, right? But the problem that you have to uh, that you have to solve in this case is to integrate these caches seamlessly with our databases so 
just adding another, you know, just adding another uh, data store, just adding another uh, another system that your applications are talking to would actually increase the complexity uh, of these apps. So this integration needs to happen seamlessly, needs to happen, uh, you know, almost transparently for the user. So that's another important thing that has to uh, that has to happen in these uh, in these microservice ar architectures, and that's one concern. Now, but this is kind of this will give you a bit of an idea of what are the challenges, what are the strategies, and how we structure microservices, and how do they like what do we expect from the databases they're talking to. It's it's also good to to take a look at what how you run them and what OpenShift as a platform has to offer for writing these applications. So if you go on the next slide, you actually uh, can see a picture like a like a very succinct diagram of OpenShift as a platform, right? So as I said earlier, the high cost of provisioning resources as physical and virtual machines favors monolith due to cost reduction reasons. And one of the biggest revolutions in infrastructure management is the rise of the cloud platform. It allows you to manage resources dynamically and elastically and helps you add modularization and agility into, the, into the, your process. So what we're gonna talk about today, like one of, the, one, of the, one of the points today is OpenShift, which is um, basically the leading Kubernetes platform that helps you build, run, and scale both applications and data services in the cloud, right? So that's a very, very, very important thing because all that we talked so far, like microservices, data services, we want to run them on, on, on a single platform. And Joe will provide more, like a little bit more about the motivations for that. But what I'm, what I'm gonna talk about next is um, a little bit, just give you a bit of a sense of how OpenShift works and how OpenShift helps into this process. So OpenShift runs containerized workloads uh, that allows you to package your applications in an immutable structure and isolate it from the underlying, underlying runtime. Containers are deployed as pods on nodes and the, the whole process is generally transparent and managed by OpenShift. From a user's perspective, the entire set of resources in a data center or a portion of the data center, whatever you want to allocate for an OpenShift cluster, whether it's on-premise or in the cloud, is pulled together and available to be allocated dynamically and elastically. Right, so that gives you, uh, that, that gives you a bit, of, that, that gives you a very, uh, a lot of ease in allocating resources. And that's basically what you expect when you run a fleet, a large fleet of like tens uh, or even larger numbers of microservices. You have to think about high availability in this context, right? So the fact that you can run multiple applications, for example, uh, the, fa the fact that you can run multiple instances of an application, the fact that you can have like load balancing automatically between them um, is basically something that the platform offers um, like out of the box. But you have to think about how you design these things. Like, for example, you have to think about the fact that applications that run for applications that run 24/7, it is important that they're not disrupted. But applications crash, or they need to be updated, or the underlying infrastructure. Like, you basically need to upgrade, for example, OpenShift. You still don't want to stop running, even if you do that. So, the common practice here is to run workloads at scale using at least two pods, for instance, running on separate not, nodes. Um, this happens like running nodes, uh, running pods on separate nodes is, is done automatically by OpenShift. And one important consequence of that is that the workloads themselves need to be, uh, uh, need to behave in a way that allows them to take advantage of this feature. So cloud native readiness is, is while, while OpenShift can definitely run you know, applications that have not been uh, uh, designed to be cloud native and that's actually kind of a big feature of it, a big, big feature of it, uh, that kind of readiness can help you uh, uh, improve your experience, right? And there are other features like which are listed on the next slide that helps you run scaled, uh, highly available applications. For example, you have lightness and readiness probes that 
can tell you whether a pod is a good or a bad state, whether it needs to be uh, taken out of, of, of rotation for a load balancer, or it needs to be uh, restarted because uh, the application just crashed, so uh, it cannot serve requests anymore. It allows you to tune resource usage. Again, a very important feature, especially when you're running resource intensive uh, workloads such as databases. It allows you to control pod placement. So while generally speaking, um, the uh, like the optimal situation is when everything like the, 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 the view, your view of the cluster is very homogenous. Sometimes you want to target specific nodes and specific types of resources. So um, there are node selectors, which are an OpenShift feature, allow you to put certain applications or certain nodes if you want to. And very importantly, um, stateful sets. So that's basically like in the, in the next slide, we have a brief uh, view of what that means. Of course, a lot, a significant number of the workloads that run on OpenShift will be stateless. They don't have resources, they restart as a blank slate. So you can imagine an application that stores everything in the uh, state in a database or it stores some data in, an, in, a, in a data grid or sends and receives messages. So those types of applications can basically restart and they don't, know to, they don't need to remember anything about what happened uh, before, like, well, before they were uh, restart, right? Uh, this is perfectly fine. So that's that's a lot of a lot of the workloads are like that. But some some workloads, such as databases or message brokers, and generally speaking, middleware, require some form of state retention. They need to retain some kind of sense of identity. So if I restart a database, for example, that's not very good if it has lost all the data that it had before. We just cannot have <laughs> ephemeral database instances, right? So this is where, where, where uh, this is where like you need to have the ability for certain deployments to retain a sense of identity, like an ID in a cluster deployment or a persistent file system, right, where, where, where they store all the information. And this is what stateful sets, uh, um, which, as I said, are essentially a Kubernetes feature, and they're available in OpenShift, which is in essentially an, um, uh, an enterprise um, uh, a, 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 an enterprise platform based on Kubernetes. They are a very powerful concept that combines elastic resource management with the resilience of state retention. Each, each pod gets an identity, and that identity is basically matched with a mounted set of persistent volumes. So inside a stateful set, for example, when a pod is lost and needs to be restarted, a same pod with the same virtual identity is reinstated and the associated storage is recreated, right? This is very important when you have, like exactly for, for, for as I said, for, for databases and um, uh, clustered. Um, so, in general speaking, for, for, for cluster data stores, because A, obviously you don't want to, to lose your persistent storage, which is important. And the other thing is we want you want the 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 uh, the the even even if even if the uh, persistent storage is reallocated to a new pod, you want it you want it to retain its whole uh, identity inside the cluster. Uh, so that you know all the replication processes and 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 and, and state replication um, features of the cluster can continue uh, uninterrupted, right? So this is one other important building blocks in 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 the notion of building data services and and on uh, on top of of OpenShift, right? And if we stop for a moment and kind of Think about like this is all about how how things happen inside one individual cluster, right? But we also need to think about how to enforce high availability at the larger scale and how to to handle disaster recovery. So if you go to the next slide, then um, there is yeah you have like a few of the options for um, handling like for 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 managing. Uh, high availability and disaster recovery. Now, the idea is that OpenShift by itself ensures resilience and reliability across a specific site. 
but you also want to, want to be shielded uh, from large scale systemic failures, such as the entire site goes down or the entire data center goes down. So by its nature, OpenShift requires low latency networking between nodes. So basically means that each OpenShift clusters run on an individual site. You cannot run, for example, an OpenShift cluster across multiple sites or across multiple data centers. In this case, you have different strategies at your disposal. So first, you can essentially just run and maintain a single site, forego disaster recovery, and whenever the site goes down, wait until it comes back again. Right? It's a very simple strategy, but obviously probably not what you want if you want to run 24-7. Um, you can have, you, you can fail over to a secondary site that means that remains inactive until required. So that's also a possible a possible strategy. Basically, as we'll see a little bit later, this can come with like with some data loss, for example. And if you want to maintain a fully cloud native approach, you can run a multi-site application. So basically this means that you have multiple clusters running across multiple sites. Uh, the clusters uh, replicate data in real time. And this also has the advantage that not only your, like all your clusters are, are active and ready to run, and they have like ideally they have uh, uh, the most up-to-date data with some like eventual uh, consistency limitations, but it also has the advantage that requests can be routed to the site that's most appropriate for the user. So for example, uh, most, geographically close to the user for, for solving uh, latency uh, problems, right? And the key here is that deploying multiple applications across the different data centers is like, it's not necessarily about the code. The key problem is to solve is how you replicate your data. So you have a few strategies at hand. On next slide, for example, we talk about uh, infrastructure-based asynchronous replication. So in this case, the, the task of, of, of um, uh, uh, replicating the, the storage data is undertaken by the, 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 uh, by the application, by the, uh, by the infrastructure itself. This works especially well if the applications are read-only and only need to be step, uh, only need to stay up to date. So one process updates one storage, and then everything else is replicated across the whole cluster. The other strategy that you have is application-based asynchronous replication, which is on the next slide. And essentially, uh, uh, this basically means that um, this is the most likely situations that you'll be in if you want to operate applications uh, using relational databases, um, which receive continuous updates and need to propagate across sites. And when we say applications here, we just mean that this is not the storage infrastructure concern. How simple or how complex this process is largely depends on our database cap capabilities. Some databases can and will automate uh, the process, uh, this process and handle it with a certain degree of transparency. Uh, in some other cases, you need to manually set up the replication infrastructure to propagate uh, application data across different databases, or some databases can do can do this on their own, right? So this is this is I think one one of the key one of the key points here that the the the, ex the quality of experience depends on the ability of the database to 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 handle this uh, this replication automatically, right? And just to make a brief point about the different disaster recovery approaches, we have essentially two. Uh, so on the next slide, for example, we have uh, basically the, uh, the a couple of variants of standby. In both, like in both scenarios, you have an active data center and you have uh, um, uh, you have a uh, uh, an idle and offline. Uh, data center that's kind of ready to take over if um, if the application uh, like the, if the primary data center goes down. Now this comes with like this this is kind of this increases the 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 likeliness of data loss because the backups are periodic. So all the data between 
two backup, backup instances, uh, two backup events, is basically lost. On the next slide, you have a slight improvement, which is maintaining a hot standby, maintaining a, a standby data center that is only used for, uh, um, you know, as a backup or at best for, for read-only operations. And this minimizes the, lot, the chance of data loss. There is still a there is still a lag between like between updates, but that is minimized by the continuous replication that takes place uh, between uh, the active and the standby data set. And of course, the 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 uh, on the last slide is basically the um, um, the active active approach, which essentially means that. Uh, all the different replicas are active. All the different replicas be, uh, receive data from their from their applications, uh, and the application and the uh, integration or replication happens in real time, right? So, obviously, this is the kind of the the most uh, you know the, the one that offers you kind of the most resilience in a way, but it's also the most complex of the three. Right, and with that, I'm going to hand it back to Joe to talk about how NeoDB handles uh, uh, these strategies. Great, thank you, Marius. Uh, that was that was terrific. Yeah, I would. Um, you, you've shared a, a bunch of useful information uh, about OpenShift and, and deploying in microservice environments. Um, yeah, I would just like to take probably the next uh, 10 minutes. I'm going to talk a little bit about. Um, how NoDB helps uh, deploy these strategies that Marius was re referring to, and then we'll also open up for some uh, some Q and A. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, first um, describing some of the pitfalls that we might see, and we've kind of been touching upon it a little bit. But you know, it, when we want to deploy uh, applications uh, in microservices, and in this example, uh, OpenShift. Um, you know, we of course want to do that to, to go ahead and gain those uh, agility and automation benefits by, by doing so. Um, but when that application is a SQL-based app, um, and then, you know, you kind of get this, right? If, if your database doesn't really run well in, in containers based on a lot of what we've been talking about today, that the natural first thing to do is, is sort of run it outside, right? You know, you, you poke a hole through the, uh, uh, the, the OpenShift containerized network to an external network, and you're able to run the application in that way, but you really haven't achieved all of the uh, agility and automations that you were hoping for. Um, you know, you, you, you create, uh, you know, network overlays that are complex and it introduces security uh, concerns. And it, it's sort of like crossing a bridge halfway, right? Your, your application is running in the environment you want, but now you're stuck managing two separate environments because your database is still running the same old way. Um, now, we can make a slight improvement, right? We, we could run a, uh, a data cache uh, with inside our containerized environment. And, you know, many of you may be familiar with these third-party client memory caching tools um, to improve performance, but they're not a pan panacea as, as well either, right? Because it still requires application development and management to ensure that the, uh, you, you maintain consistency between your caching layer and your database. And then there's this sort of third one that uh, I've kind of pictured in this, um, you know, swollen container looking uh, environment here where, well, what if we took the entire monolithic database and we ran it in a container? Well, that doesn't fit the model either, of course, right? Containers were not designed to run, uh, you know, uh, complex multitasking uh, database systems. Um, so again, you don't get the benefits of the microservice uh, deployment environment and you know the ability to leverage um, these uh, these automations that that we've been discussing um, so we're really looking for a different approach and i would describe each one of these as sort of that square peg in a round hole but you know when we look for that better approach we want to look for something where we can deploy a single operational environment right one environment not the two and um and, and, and then, you know, by doing so, we're going to lower operational costs, right? Now we're maintaining one environment, um, which is, um, you know, of course, the, the, the goal and the ideal. And by maintaining the one environment, and this speaks to some of what uh, Marius was describing earlier, but the benefits of running a localized database now in an OpenShift container network, uh, you're not going to incur those latencies 
of that um, of those remote database calls, right? Your database is effectively running inside of OpenShift as an embedded database. And then, uh, you know, deploying NoDB uh, as a container native database because NoDB is a uh, uh, leverages a, a redundant process architecture. It allows the database to scale the transactional layer and the storage layers independently. And we'll see what some of those benefits uh, can, can be uh, realized uh, in, uh, coming up. And, and then lastly, the uh, uh, increasing developer uh, productivity through the, 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 the same sort of CI, CD, uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment pipelines that you want to use in your microservice deployment environment. Uh, so NuoDB is deployment agnostic. Uh, so, you know, if we look at the, uh, the, the scale-up nature of the non-container databases, they must deploy on specific systems that were configured in a special way to get the performance that, that you need. Um, and because of that, they are generally deploying outside of the container network, as I was showing on the, the previous uh, slide. Um, NuoDB's processes run uh, wherever you like. They can run in containers, VMs, virtual um, uh, systems, physical systems. Uh, so they really are deployment agnostic. They are processes that are going to run within a process space. And this allows for much greater agility and uh, deployment automation. So here's a, a picture of what that would sort of look like. So uh, NoDB is a container uh, native SQL database. It's, it's inherently a distributed SQL database. Um, it it's, uh, offers the scale out by simply um, adding more nodes means adding more database processes to handle more transactional throughput or more storage durability. To the right, we see the TEs. Those are the transaction engines. That's what's servicing the application transactions. And the SMs are the storage managers. That's what's persisting the database to disk uh, using a lot of the technologies that um, uh, Marius was referring to node selectors and stateful sets and leveraging um, uh, PVCs, pers persistent volume claims, claims to ensure that the data always resides, that it's not ephemeral. Um, so the, the last point here too is this idea around the built-in data uh, protection. Uh, the SMs automatically sync with each other. Um, so it's, it's offering um, now, continuous availability, there really is no failover event on, a D, on DR. It's, it's, um, uh, if you should lose a process, either a TE or an SM, the database continues to run. As long as there is a single TE and SM, the database will run. It may see less performance, of course, because you have less processes servicing applications, but it's all about continuous availability. Um, so just wanted to also touch upon the, uh, the in-memory cache, uh, these TEs that I'm mentioning, the transaction engines, they are effectively a distributed in-memory cache. Each one of them is uh, uh, keeping a, a cache of the database, so the database continues to run at optimal speeds. If, if the data is not available in a current TE's cache, it can grab uh, another data uh, element, or as we call them, atoms, from another local TE, its, it's nearest neighbor, if you will. And this effectively creates this, uh, this distributed cache and, and offers a very low latency transactional data access. Um, and speaking more to the kind of the HR and how the, the system protects itself, uh, Maris was talking a lot uh, at the end towards uh, about active-active and how that can be difficult to, uh, you know, to deploy. But with NoDB, it's native to the product. It is an active, active, um, you know, always on architecture. So here where we see like a, a zone one and zone two, these could be availability zones. As we spread the NoDB um, uh, processes, these engine processes onto the availability zones, uh, we have two in each zone for the transaction engines. Each one of them are running in a pod. Uh, those pods that uh, Marius was describing earlier, as well as the storage managers are also running in their own containers or pods. So if we should uh, lose uh, one or two or even a complete zone, our database remains available. And perhaps that could be what was so important to the, you know, that the top requirement the CIO had earlier when we were um, referencing it is this uh, idea around 
the, the application must always be on, must always be available. And NeuroDB can achieve that in an open shift uh, orchestrated process environment. This is just a quick example of what I mentioned earlier about uh, if, if the database can scale independently, the transactional and storage component, well, now your database can serve many different applications uniquely and specifically to their requirements, right? For web mobile apps, we can scale more TEs than SMs. For OLTP, we may want to uh, run about the same scale, right? Logging apps, we need more storage, right? We're going to scale that out so we can log faster. And for an HTAP, a hybrid transactional uh, analytical, we may actually configure those TEs differently, some with more memory, some with less. So you now have all that great control uh, available to you. I talked a little earlier about the, uh, um, you know, the deployment model of uh, uh, continuous integration and deployment. Right, you want those same benefits for your database. Uh, we, we talked about crossing the bridge halfway. Well, we really don't want to do that. We want to cross the full bridge and take full advantage of the, uh, the OpenShift uh, microservices deployment environment by also adding the database to your pipelines and, and uh, allowing for rolling upgrade and uh, implementation of, of operators for uh, many of your operational type tasks can be easily now automated, okay? And that, that uh, brings us to the, uh, the idea around automated operators. Uh, again, another one of the Kubernetes features. Uh, and um, this is a feature that um, we're currently implementing now, Kubernetes operators, to simplify all of these areas of rolling upgrades, scale in and out, backup and restore. And I thought I would just finish with a, a quick little view of, of just what does a, a new DB database look like inside of OpenShift. I took a little picture here. So you could see up above is the new DB uh, monitoring interface that's showing that we have two running transaction engines. Um, I'll point them out here. We have two uh, storage managers. We can see the memory and CPU footprint for all of the the, the running pods on the system. And we happen to see here in the middle, the aggregate transaction throughput, where um, I was scaling up the number of transaction engines, which doubled the throughput of the application um, from about 50 to uh, right around 100 uh, transactions per second, simply by clicking up on the number of uh, OpenShift um, transactional pods. And uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and land on the thank you slide. And you have some links here on how you can learn more about Red Hat and NuoDB and what we're doing in the microservices um, uh, deployment architectures for your applications. And uh, yeah, I wanted to turn it over to Billy. And um, Billy, do we have those, um, those polling questions that we would be able to uh, share with our community? Ah. So here are there you go. Here's the first poll question. Great. Thank you, Billy. So we're, we have a few polling questions we thought we'd have a little fun with just to, uh, you know, are you considering deploying a, a microservices architecture? Please submit your answers and we'll get to share all our results for, for all of you. Close the poll in about 10 seconds. And we just have two other questions uh, and that uh, build upon each other to give you all hopefully a sense of where maybe you're at in your own microservices deployments and, and what you may be considering over the six, uh, next six months or so. Um, Billy, do they get to see all the questions? Oh, oh. Okay. It's just Terrific. one at a time. Here's the results awesome. for the first one. Awesome. Thank you. Well, overwhelming. Uh, looks like many of us now are are uh, considering and on our way to deploy microservice uh, architectures. Billy, why don't we try for the next one? All right. Here we go. Are you considering deploying the OpenShift platform in the next six months? 
I don't know if many of you were out at the Red Hat Summit, but I know I met many of you there and others, and uh, many were there to, to learn more about how to deploy OpenShift and, and uh, enhance their, their current deployments. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and show you all the results. All right. Would be good also there to see, um, you know, the next 12 months as well. Um, let's go. Hold, let's go for the, uh, the the next. All right. Yeah. Last looks like we've got about 30. Great. Thank you, Billy. So it looks like we got about 30% of you that are already looking to deploy uh, OpenShift in the next six months. Um, how about of of those? And this is where we touched upon a lot of these enterprise applications are SQL based. How many are looking to deploy SQL based applications in OpenShift in the next six months or so? And hopefully as you're considering deploying that, you've learned some new techniques today on how you can actually run an embedded SQL database right inside of, of OpenShift to, uh, to gain all the agility and automation and performance benefits uh, that new ODB can provide. About 10 more seconds and I'll close out the poll. All right, sounds good, Billy. All right, here are the results. All right, so just about 25%, one out of four are going down this path right now in the next six months of deploying uh, SQL based uh, in OpenShift. So that's, that's fantastic. So and I do imagine over the next 12 months, you know, of course, those numbers need to increase. Uh, but that's very useful. Thank you, Billy. Of course. I'll hide the results now. And would you like to do the Q&A portion now? Yeah, that would, be, uh, that would be terrific. Awesome. So we had a few questions come in from you guys. The first one is, how can I start using NuoDB on OpenShift? Well, one of the easiest ways to start um, is we have uh, a container um, that's available along with a YAML that will allow you to uh, deploy uh, the environment. In fact, you're seeing right now uh, an OpenShift environment, um, and that's what I've done is I basically did add project, and it started a database right inside OpenShift. We are currently updating our container right now to, to add uh, stateful sets, the uh, persistent volume claims, as well as the uh, YAML file deployment. Um, so within the next week or so, uh, look for our container up, uh, up on the, uh, in, in the OpenShift catalog. Uh, and of course, you're always welcome to contact us um, through our website or through the contact information uh, we provided in today's presentation. But it's very easy to get up and going and running with no DB uh, inside of OpenShift. Great. The next question is, do you have an opt optimal way to implement event sourcing? Uh, an optimal way to uh, implement, sorry, I missed that. E implement event sourcing. Event sourcing. Uh, yeah, so I think the, the question is around uh, when the database uh, has events and alerts, how we can then propagate those. Um, so we do have our own set of, of events we're sourcing, and those will go into the environment that you see on the upper part of your screen, um, the monitoring place. Um, we're currently building this out where we're showing the, um, uh, the more OS-related metrics and transactional pieces but we're also going to uh, source events and show alerts of, you know, what, what may be uh, happening in the environment and then, you know, how to root cause uh, th those types of uh, uh, database um, issues. And, and, and go, go ahead. I would like to add, like, a compliment to what uh, <clears throat> Joe has just said. So for, um, for event sourcing on uh, especially for event sourcing applications on OpenShift, um, the, we have uh, support through, so there is a project that we strongly recommend you to take a look at, which is called Debezium. 
uh, that is uh, used for uh, implementing CDC on top of a number of relational databases. I don't think, uh, I'm, I'm not sure about any plans right now for integrating with, uh, with NeoDB, but essentially what it does is it, uh, it monitors your, like all your uh, transactions and all your changes to the transactional log and it sends them to Kafka as, uh, as standardized events. So that's one one of the things to to look at in the um, uh, in the OpenShift uh, Red Hat universe. So that's kind of a good complement. Again, I think I don't think we I don't think it applies necessarily to NeoDB right now. But I think Joe, what do you think? <laughs> I think that could be an interesting addition for the future. Absolutely. Um, Th thank you, Marius. That's that's really good information. Awesome. Our next question is. Any tool migration from RDBMS to NuoDB? So RDBMS is a traditional relational database. Uh, NuoDB um, works with uh, traditional databases from a data migration standpoint. It will easily migrate uh, the data from uh, that database into NuoDB. Um, using our native migration tools. So we, we try to make that very simple. Uh, NoDB is a, uh, you know, it's an ACID uh, compliant uh, and full ANSI standard SQL database. So uh, all those SQLs that run against um, uh, RDB is, is going to run against uh, NuoDB. And, and that's really what we talked about in the earlier part is that, you know, the, the NoSQL is a tough transition, but when you transition from an already existing SQL database to NuoDB, it's quite simple. Great. Our next question is, can I copy SQL Server databases into NuoDB? Yep, that's uh, very similar to the previous question. It, you know, again, we're, we work with all of the, you know, the, the main database products. Um, we will um, uh, read uh, and extract data from a SQL Server. One of the important pieces what NuoDB does is it, it's looking at the source data types and then how to then translate them into the receiving NuoDB data type. So the data movement and streaming is probably the easy part. What, what NuoDB does for you is it makes sure that your data is coming over into NuoDB as the proper you know, string or char or date or numeric type integer or decimal so that your applications continue to work as expected. We also have a migration uh, webinar on our website. If you uh, care to look more uh, uh, and learn more about that, just go up to nodb.com and, and look for the, the data migration webinar. We, we actually migrated a MySQL database uh, during the webinar <laughs> in three easy steps. So it's kind of fun. Uh, please go out and enjoy that as well. Thank you all for the questions. And I'd also like to thank Joe and Marius for a great presentation. And I'd also like to thank today's sponsor, NuoDB, for providing the DZone audience with a great webinar presentation. And I'd also like to thank everyone who joined today. We hope you learned something new today that will help you in your developer career. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you.